Amen. All right. This article appeared that read, Scientists debate the existence of a divine agent. It was in a sold-out hall, and students had the opportunity to watch four panelists uh, 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 use scientific theories and portions of the Bible to debate over some of life's most significant questions. And it was sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ, and it was a two-day program, and it was simply called Evolution versus Intelligent Design. And so arguing for the existence of a divine creator was a Dr. Rana. He's the president of a ministry called Reasons to Believe, which is an organization uh, created to prove that science and the Bible actually complement each other. Uh, yeah, because God doesn't lie. Okay, good science and it all works out that way. So, but the opposition was two UC Davis professors. One was a Dr. Albright and a Dan Potter. Immediately, though, during this presentation, Albright commented, listen, once again, that he didn't believe that the creationist work was even science. There it is again. And Potter said that, listen, he was more foreboding. He said that uh, science and religion, the merging of the two, is just a bad idea. He said that religion and science are separate ways of defining the world. And listen, merging them could be damaging to society and religion. It's whatever. But, proof's in the pudding. A UC Davis student, uh, Jessica, uh, she said, after hearing what the professors had to say about how science is always changing, evolution... She said, I think it takes more faith to believe in their version than in God. Okay? That's what happens when you get the facts out there. Now, again, the reason why I keep bringing up these articles is because you repeat a lie loud enough, long enough, and often enough, people will believe it. And when you start talking about intelligent design, our world has done a masterful job of not only ignoring the evidence and suppressing the evidence, but even when the evidence gets out there, they say, well, that's not science. Okay, and that's exactly what the guy said, that it's not science. How is it not science when in our study, certainly we're looking at the scriptural evidence, but the rest of our study is looking at what kind of evidence? Science. So how in the world is that not science? And once again, when you take a look at the facts of science, you see that it does not back up evolution. That's why they're suppressing this, okay? It actually gives credence to the creation account. Okay, and so much so that if you were here last time, we saw that article uh, about the dinosaur soft tissue that was found, a ton of it, even with the feathers on this particular one, and uh, which obviously, how can that be true uh, if this is supposed to be 65, 70 million years ago? Okay, well, uh, I wanted to share with you an actual video clip of it, because I want you to see just how soft this soft tissue from a dinosaur really is. Let's take a look uh, at this. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You see, I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> You'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that looked suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, How could that be? How could that be? That's right. Hmm. I got a theory and it goes like this. Uh, the reason why uh, you're shocked at it is because uh, evolution's a lie. Uh, and the Bible is true, okay? Because logically, if there really was a worldwide flood that happened roughly 44, 4,500 years ago, and if that's really what took out the dinosaurs, then that's not that long enough ago to where you would be shocked to find in certain instances some still soft tissue that's been preserved for us, okay? Piece of cake, right? But not if it's 68 million years ago, okay? That's the problem, folks, is what's going on, okay? And again, notice what I liked about that is the scientists who discovered it, first of all, it was by accident. Didn't even mean to do it. They don't even think to do it because they got it so ingrained in their head, it's been no way they could ever find this soft tissue because this has been millions and millions of years ago. She accidentally discovered it, okay, and blow the lid off. But notice what her response there, if you were paying attention. She says, and what, what did you do? She said, I didn't want to tell anyone. I was afraid to tell anyone. She even used the words, I had to muster up the courage to tell the truth. 
Now, wait a second. I thought this was about science. I thought this was about discovery. I thought this was about just dealing with the facts. And if that's really what it is, an open market of just discovering the facts and then disseminating the truth based on facts, why would you be scared? Unless there really is a suppression of the truth going on and they got a system in place that shuts out the truth and if you find anything that disagrees with the truth, truth you're going to lose your job. And we already saw, folks, that's already in place, okay? That is not science. And again, what we've been seeing in our study, according to Romans chapter 1, those who suppress the truth about God's existence and certainly the biblical account, what are they actually doing? So up the wrath of God. Once again, how many guys would say, take up crocheting with a bunny or something? Much safer, it's awesome, you know, it's uh, uh, maybe even biodegradable, I don't know, it depends on your yarn. But uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to continue, that's right, in our study, taking a look at the witness of God's creation. Absolutely wonderful, the handiwork of God, it's all over the place, and that's what we're doing. We're taking a look at different evidences that God's left behind for us, Romans chapter 1, so that we can not only know that He is real, but we can really have a personal relationship with Him through Jesus Christ on the cross. We've already seen the first evidence was the evidence of an intelligent creation or intelligent design. We've seen the first four evidences of that in our journey from the telescope. Now we get tonight, Lord willing, to the microscope. The evidence of the universe, the solar system, the human body, the animal kingdom. And last time we saw that how not only mammals and flying creatures, but those uh, and the slimy creatures, but even those buggy creatures, right? How many guys went home and wished you could have got one of those bombardier beetles to get rid of your spiders? Pow, pow, pow. Wasn't that a cool video, huh? And uh, what we saw there is obviously you take a look at the scientific facts there. Okay, give me a break. That didn't happen by chance. It couldn't happen over millions of years in a slow process. It, it has to be there fully functioning or beetles blow up and blown up beetles have no babies. Say that one five times. I almost didn't make it myself. Whew. Uh, but that's not all. The fifth evidence, we're getting smaller as we go. Uh, the fifth evidence of a God uh, designing our world, folks, is from the evidence of the plant kingdom. When the Bible says God created all things, he created all things. Okay, and that includes the plants. Let's go back to the Genesis account. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And uh, if you find the, the preface, what do you do? Hang around. And, uh, but let's take a look. Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Let's take a look. Where did the plants come from? Okay, who made these? Was it just an accidental uh, cosmic accident and took millions of years for grass to form? Uh, but uh, how many guys wish it took millions of years for like crabgrass and those kind of things to form? But... They just pop up, don't they? I'll tell you what. Oh, let's continue on. Uh, verse uh, 9 there, Genesis chapter 1. You get there, say moo. Got a couple moos, let's go. Uh, and God said, who said? God said this, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. And let what? Dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land. And then he gathered the waters and gathered the waters. He called them the seas. And God saw that this was good. Okay, then God said, let the land produce what? vegetation, specifically seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the billionth year. Oh, I'm sorry, the third billionth year. Oh, I'm sorry, the what? Third day. And then it means a literal day. It said morning, evening, hello, Okay, it is what it is, okay? It didn't take a billion years uh, for that to happen, okay? But according to our text, the Bible clearly says, page one, by the way, unless, again, you have that large print, it might be page 19, but page one, the Bible says that God, listen, he didn't just create the ground, okay? What else did he create? The plants that come out of the ground, okay? Now, again, now we got a problem here, okay? This is a war of worldviews, okay? What does evolution teach? They say, oh, yeah, look at all those plants and trees that we see. They came from the hand of God. Is that what they say? No, they say, hey, look at those plants and trees that evolved from a single cell blob. Okay? And so here's the point. Okay? Put on your thinking caps. How are you going to find out who's telling the truth? Those are two things that don't mix. You can't mix them together. And they both can be true. All right? So how are you going to find out? Well, let's take a look at the facts. Let's take a look at the scientific data, even on plants. And you see uh, who in the world is responsible for them. I think it's God. But let's take a look at the facts. Don't just take my word for it. We're going to start with one called the ajuga plant. Say the ajuga plant. This thing is cool, man. Check this out. Uh, it's in North Africa. And uh, when locusts in North Africa move across the ground, they eat everything in their path. You ever seen videos of that? Remember the final countdown study and the locust invasions? They eat anything, right? But listen, they skip over this baby. This is one plant they won't touch. And well, why? 
Well, listen to the way it's designed. It just so happens the ajuga plant produces an insect hormone that's identical to the locust hormone, which in turn just so happens to cause them to prematurely molt. Right, now, I know it's getting late tonight, and some of you are very tired. But how many guys can concur that plants have no brains? All seven of you, the rest of you, get some rest. But anyway, that is what? How does a plant know how to, first of all, produce a hormone, but specifically make sure it's an insect hormone, and specifically it's one to uh, coincide with this particular insect to cause it to molt? It's amazing, folks. It has to be. And therefore, if the locust eats the ajuga plant, it is literally forced by the plant to prematurely shed its skin. Okay, and listen to this. And not just shed its skin in a normal way. It just so happens that the hormone produced in the ajuga plant is five times stronger than normally found in the locust. And therefore, they don't just molt. They're literally forced to pop right out of their skin. Boom! Right? It's kind of like when you eat chicken. You know, your skin just boom. It's like, yeah, you know what happens. You don't want to admit it. Okay, but can you, isn't that amazing? Wow, that, that's an that's a, 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 a early detecting a, a system. Of protect, well, how does that happen? Hey, aren't you guys glad that all those uh, 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 home uh, protecting systems that you get, uh, uh, that you have to pay a service for, uh, that where they get their equipment has just evolved over millions of years? And they're really ripping this off because it's already in our house, evolved on the outside. And they're start charging us a month. Man, aren't we fools? <laughs> That's what this guy's got built in. But that's not. This uh, rapid molting also causes them to lose their skin from around their mouths, which makes them starve to death. So it's got a double defense going in there. And that's my theory. That's why at KFC, they serve you tons of napkins because they know they're going to have lawsuits. You get that stuff all over your mouth. Yeah, I'm going hard on this one. But you guys, I'm, I'm here for you. Therefore, <laughs> locusts may be bugs, uh, but they're not stupid. They leave this plant alone. I don't want to pop out of my skin and starve to death, okay? They're not stupid, okay? Absolutely amazing. That's just a plant. And again, plants have no brains, man. This is amazing. That's the tip of the iceberg. This one's called the thorny acacia. It's in Central Africa. And this plant, again, has no brains, can actually tell when animals are feeding on it too much. It's got an early warning system built in too. And, and it goes as soon as 15 minutes after the tree detects leaf damage... First of all, how can it do that with no brain? It starts to produce a chemical called tannin K. Okay? And it literally gets a signal and it goes, wait a second, you're chewing on me way too much, pal. Okay? And so it starts to produce this chemical and a specific chemical called tannin K. Why? Well, it just so happens this chemical makes the leaves start tasting really, really bad so that whatever's feeding on it gets a mouthful of yuck. So it starts out tasting, mmm, -hmm, right? See, that's how you're fooled by chicken. And then as it goes on, about 15 minutes, it's like, what is that? Ugh, right? And so it actually produces it into the leaves to make it yucky, so pff, spit it out and stop eating it. Turn to somebody and say, listen, you're not getting it. Plants have no brains. Go ahead. Isn't that wild? It's absolutely amazing, okay? Now, after the tree produces yucky taste, it goes on. It then proceeds to produce a stinky odor. Right? It's got a stage two in it, too, also. Why? Well, it just so happens that this odor acts as an alarm to the other acacia trees nearby, warning them to produce more tannin in their leaves as well. And guess what they do? So like, say, a herd of whatever is, is coming through their giraffes and are starting to munch on the tree, they make it bleh, yucky, then they produce a stinky smell, the other trees pick up on it, and they start producing yucky leaves as well. Okay, what's that? Uh, I think that's part of the fruit on the tree, and that's why that guy uh, was on there, and he was making that smell right there, because it stinks, okay? I don't know if he was trying to eat the leaves. He should have went down and got a cheeseburger or something, but uh, it started to stink, okay? Uh, but anyway, this one's wild, okay? Check out this plant, okay? Notice the, the wasp there? Okay, watch this. Uh, uh, this is, it's a certain variety of orchid, the Ophrys orchid, and it has on it what appears to be a 3D picture of a female wasp, complete with eyes, antenna, and wings on its petals. Okay, as you can kind of see there, it looks kind of like that there. But that's not all. It actually, again, gives off the actual odor of a female wasp in mating condition. Okay, there's a, a male wasp there on uh, what looks like a female wasp. And the reason why is because it's part of a uniquely designed plan to trick the male wasp into mating with the phony female wasp, which in turn pollinates the flower. Produces a dummy female. So, a fake... So, anyway, it's like... I mean, first of all, how does that evolve? How does that happen over millions of years? I mean, even if you could somehow as a plant, which, again, turn to somebody, plants have no brains. How do you decide as a plant one day and say, you know what? 
I got to get pollinated somehow. And even if he can get a leg to pop out, a female wasp leg to pop out, yeah! But that ain't good enough. He's going to fly right on by. And what, what's the plant yell? Oh, he, does, he can't yell because he doesn't have a brain, doesn't have a mouth. Uh, stop! Give me another million years. I'll get the other leg and the eyeballs next. Oh. How does that work? It all has to be there. Okay, this one's cool. The dwarf mistletoe, uh, it's here in America, and it could actually build up the same amount of hydraulic pressure that's contained within a truck tire, not just a car tire, a truck tire. Why? Well, this is what it does. It happens to use that, that's a picture of it, to use the water pressure to catapult its seeds up to 50 feet away at a speed of about 60 miles an hour. Right, and that's the one you don't want to stare at very long, unless you want to become a pirate, arg, you know, stuff like that. But then I got to think about this. Wouldn't this be cool? You could probably get away with this. Please don't try this at home. I'll get an email. I guess it's a joke. But it is kind of interesting. Uh, can you imagine instead of planting all those hedges uh, in front of your house, right? If you planted a bunch of these guys. And you ever get those animals that walk across your yard and do their thing? <laughs> oh, yeah. You get away with it. Oh, I'm sorry to hear, Bob. You're... Sparky's got one eye. I don't, I, you know, can you imagine it? It's cool. Okay, the diatom. This is cool. Diatom is actually where we get diatomaceous earth. You heard of that? That's where these come from, this little tiny little plant. Absolutely exquisite, okay? And uh, it's supposed to be, used to be looked upon as one of the most simplest plants of all until they turn the microscope on it, okay? And so let's take a look. Is it really that simple? I don't think so. First of all, the diatom is made mostly of fragile glass material, yet it's almost indestructible. It's fireproof, yet it's used to make dynamite. Uh, it's got explosive properties to it, yet it's used in mines to reduce explosions. Uh, it tastes like fish oil, but it's used in toothpaste. Uh, it has no apparent means of locomotion, but it travels around. That's a picture of one right at the top. It travels around by straining its own cytoplasm through one window and out the other, and it looks something like an exquisitely carved pillbox. That's a uh, magnification one up top. Uh, how many of you guys could make one of those if you tried? Okay, absolutely amazing. Yet this pillbox then duplicates itself by growing a new lid on the box, and then the lid grows a new box, and on and on it goes. Okay, in fact, there are over 5,000 different types of these diatoms, and yet no two are exactly alike. Absolutely unique. In fact, they're incredibly complex, yet amazingly small, with about 14 million of them could fit in a thimble of water. But it's still not all. They're the ones responsible for producing the oil that gives fish the fishy smell, yet their skeletons are used to refine sugar. And even though they're one of the smallest organisms in the world, they're still responsible for recycling 90% of the oxygen we breathe and providing most of the food for the fish and the whales. Okay. In fact, it's so, this so-called simple plant is so complex in construction that they use it to test the resolving power of microscope lenses. Do you want to see how good this microscope that man engineered and designed and made works? Put it on this so-called simple plant and see how well it works. Absolutely amazing. So that's the question. How could these things ever evolve slowly over time and at what stage of development could any of them survive unless they're all functioning at the same time? It all has to be there at the same time. It's absolutely insane. In fact, turn to your Bibles real quick uh, to Matthew chapter 6. I like bringing this up. And this is what my mind goes to when I read this uh, wonderful statement from Jesus. Because it's, it's encouragement. We talked about this before. When you take a look at God's handiwork and his creation, his design, that means he's got to design folks in everything. Does, does that mean that uh, uh, he just created everything and he's got hands off? No, everything we go through is designed. Romans 8, 28 says he designs it for good. Okay, but Jesus makes this amazing statement. I don't know if you ever picked up on this before. But in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, let's take a look there, and uh, starting with verse 25. And Jesus says this. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body, what you're going to wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? And he gives two analogies. He says, first of all, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And then he goes on and says this. And why do you worry about your clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't labor nor spin. Listen, here's what he says. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor. Solomon, the richest man ever. He had some threads, you know, decked out. Jesus said, the plants there, he says, Solomon, not even in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. 
And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the fire, how much more will he not clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Can I translate that for you? Could, could you take a look at the diatom there? Do you see how absolutely amazing that is? Do you see the complexity of the design there? Not even Solomon was decked out like that, baby. And if that's just a simple goofball plant that you make cat litter out of, don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Isn't that amazing? It's common sense, folks, and I just wanted to bring that up. But also, again, you see the design, it applies a designer. And this is what, listen, this is Arthur Shalow. He's a professor of physics at Stanford University. He's a winner of a Nobel Prize in physics, too. And listen to what he said. He said, it seems to me that when confronted with the marvels of life and the universe, one must ask not just how, but why. He said, the only possible answers are religious. That's what it leads to. He said, I find, listen, this is a professor of physics at Stanford. This is the guy who won a Nobel Prize uh, 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 for physics, okay? Remember, and again, this is not supposed to be science, but here's this scientist saying, listen, I find, when you look at the evidence, I find a need for God in the universe and in my life when you deal with the facts, okay? But that's right, folks, we're not done. We got the next evidence. We're down to the microscope. Give it up for the bacteria. Yay! Okay, yeah, mold. You guys like mold? Yeah, I don't either, but uh, it, it gives a lot of evidence of God's design. We're going to take a look at some bacteria. We're going to take a look at some cells. We're going to take a look at the DNA. Huh, man, absolutely amazing. And you tell me if this accidentally spawned onto the scene. I don't think so. The first one we're going to take a look at is, is the lasso mold. This, this thing's kind of cool. Okay, <clears throat> there are some molds out there that are not only pretty gross looking. You know, like if you uh, look underneath the piece of chicken that you get. It's that green, yeah, you know what's out there. All right. <clears throat> it's pretty gross looking, but it's mold, some of them, <clears throat> they're actually predators. They're on the hunt, right? And one of them is the lasso mold, and what he does is he actually captures and feeds on the nematodes, the nematode worms, and it might not sound like a big deal, okay, until you realize how he does it. It literally makes him the cowboy of the microscopic world. This guy uses, he, he lassoes them. It's really cool. Believe it or not, this guy actually makes a uh, rope Okay, and proceeds to lasso his prey, and here's what he does. First of all, there's a picture of it. The mold uh, uh, is small and shaped like a thread. But the nematode, you can see the green thing, is way bigger, right? So here's what the mold does to get his chow. Okay, it doesn't stop the mold. As soon as he senses the presence of the nematode nearby, he immediately, listen, proceeds to grow. He doesn't just have it hanging there. He just, he starts to grow that small loop out the side of his body so that as the nematode travels along, okay, its head passes through that loop and in just one-tenth of a second, the loop swells, clamps down on the worm, lassoing it, and the mold pulls in and starts eating it. How does that evolve? Okay, and how does that evolve slowly over time? And if it's supposed to be based on a function and need, okay, why, how come we don't have stuff like this? I was thinking about this. Ladies, you know, you're in the, with the little crumb snatchers, okay? If you remember those days, and, and uh, you're trying to shop in the store, what are they always doing, man? They're running down the aisles. Get back here. Wouldn't that be neat? All of a sudden, you go, <laughs> lasso that, get, get you, right? right? If that, that's all it was, just out of necessity, you evolve this stuff, right? Over moons of years. Why don't moms have that? In fact, I like what one guy says. Hey, if evolution is true, how come uh, mothers don't have eight arms by now? <laughs> that's a necessity, right? Okay? It's crazy, folks. And that's what we see with this mold, okay? But the cell, let's take a look at that. The cell is a literal factory containing an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines. Each of them are composed of large protein machines. They're bristling with high-tech re machinery. Remember that video that we saw? Okay, this is what we're describing here uh, is going on. It's, it's a literal factory inside there. Okay. In fact, on the outside of each cell are sensors, gates, pumps, identification markers. Inside it's jam-packed with literal power plants. There's automated workshops. There's recycling units. This is all going on inside the cell. Uh, and, and there's miniature monorails. They whisk materials back and forth from one location to another, share supplies. And that's why it's been said, listen, that even the most advanced automated modern factory with all its computers and robots all coordinated on a precisely timed schedule is less complex than the inner workings of a supposed simple cell. There's nothing simple about it. It's more complex than what we design. Okay? 
It didn't just happen by chance. That's the cell. And apparently, the so-called simplest of all cells, the paramecium, that's a picture up top. How many of you guys think that that's the bottom of your shoe after you walk the strip at Vegas? That's gum and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. And, and fur uh, growing on the side. Anyway, so that's the paramecium. But it's the supposed simplest of all cells. The paramecium is actually more complex than the space shuttle, which is the most complex machine that mankind has ever designed, engineered, and built. There is no such thing as a simple cell. And that's important to know because the whole premise of evolution would have you and I believe that it all started with a supposed simple cell. There has never been a simple cell. It's ridiculous. Right from the get-go, it's a lie. Okay, but this one, I saved the best for last. It's called the bacterial flagellum. And this is the tail-like structure that propels the E. coli bacteria through the microscopic world. This is just the tail. Okay, this is wild. Uh, listen to this tale. It consists of about 40 individual protein parts, including, that's, a, that's a, a picture of it right here, that's the tail on the bacteria. It includes a stator, a rotor, a drive shaft, a U-joint, and a propeller, and it makes it a literal microscopic outboard motor. Well, it's one thing to have a motor on the backside, but how does this thing run? Well, listen to how efficient this is. Believe it or not, it creates its own electrical power to run this motor by developing a voltage difference across the cell membrane. Uh, but how good is it? Check out this origin. How'd you like to put this on your boat? Maybe you wouldn't. But anyway, <laughs> this motor runs at 100,000 RPM. It could stop on a microscopic dime, make a quarter turn, shift directions, and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the opposite direction. I don't care what transmission man designs, you fry that baby the first time you do that. <laughs> right? This guy does it all the time. Where'd that come from? Okay, in fact, it's not only water-cooled with two gears, forward and reverse, but it travels about one micron uh, per second, which is said to be equivalent to you and I swimming 60 miles per hour through peanut butter. <laughs> now, I like peanut butter, but I don't want to do that. You know, it's a little messy. All right. uh, but, by the way, this is the amazing complex bacteria featured on, guess what? That video, Unlocking the Mystery of Life, that PBS pulled from its website. So I wanted to give you a little treat. Let's take a look at what they didn't want you to see. Hmm, I wonder why they pulled it from the website. Let's take a look. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in, in my view. In speaking on the topic of scientific naturalism and evolution... During the early 1990s, at a series of academic conferences, Behe first shared his doubts about the ability of natural selection to construct complex molecular machines. One machine particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. 
the bacterial flagellum. Two gears, forward and reverse, water cooled, proton motive force. It has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function. Um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. Let me translate that for you. We have no stinking idea. Okay. Actually, I think you do, and you're suppressing it. That's God. Only God could do something like that, folks. Okay, and that's why they don't want this information out. That's why they yanked it from the website. Excuse me? I think that's pretty clear. But that's still in all, folks. Let's take a look at the DNA. Uh, the amount of information contained on just a pinhead's worth of DNA, if you were to write that out in paperback books, it would make a pile of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. Just on a pinhead. That's how much information is contained on there. And, and the, uh, did you know the amount of human genomes that could fit on a pinhead is more than one-fifth the population of the world can fit on just a pinhead. Uh, if you stretch out the DNA material contained on just a pinhead into wire, it will go around the equator over 30 times. Very complex. And there's also over 3 billion nucleotides in a single DNA of a single human cell. Uh, and every single one is aligned sequentially in a very specific order. And by the way, that order sequentially is the same forward and reverse. Okay, and if you start taking out anything, if, if any of that is random, it messes the whole thing up. Lord willing, maybe we'll get into that at another time. It's absolutely amazing. And meaning that, that now you have three billion complicated chemical links in just one human cell. Absolutely amazing. In fact, uh, this is why DNA molecule is now known to be 45 trillion times more efficient than the silicon megachip, which, by the way, was made by a team of guess who? Designers. This thing's way more complex. So again, how could these things ever evolve slowly over time? And at what phase of development could they survive unless all this is fully functioning at the same time? You can't. Oh, and by the way, just to give you a little teaser on how complex, again, just the DNA is that God's wired into us. His handiwork is all over when you take a look at the facts. If I were to come up to you and say, hey, Ron, tell you what, Ron, I want you to back up just a teaspoon of your DNA. It's a guy thing in the computers. We're going to get her done, right? Just a teaspoon, by the way. Not a tablespoon, a teaspoon of your DNA, okay? How many CDs would that take? Well, here's the scenario, okay? I would have to show up at your door, Ron, and I would have to give you one million CDs to back up just a teaspoon of your DNA. But I'm not done. I have to show up at your doorstep uh, with one million CDs every minute for nine and a half years to back up just the teaspoon of DNA. Now, Ron and I, I think we get along pretty well, but I think we'd tire our relationship if I did this. Hey, Ron, here's a million CDs. Start backing up a teaspoon of your DNA. I left his house, knocked on the door. Exactly a minute later, hey, Ron, here's another million. Keep on backing up. Yuck, yuck, yuck. I left his house. Exactly a minute later, knocked on his door. Hey, Ron, here's a million CDs. Hey, keep on going. Whew, pile them up over here. Do something. I'll be back in one minute. I did that 24 hours a day, seven days a week for nine and a half years. It would strain our relationship. <laughs> Can you believe that? And that happened by, there's no way. It's crazy. And folks, when you take a look at all this evidence, this facts, this is why I think Robert Jastrow, he's a NASA PhD scientist. Here's his conclusion on the matter. He says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Can I translate that? He's greeted by the evidence that I should have just read the first page of the Bible. <laughs> That's what he's saying. NASA scientist. Okay? Why? Because when you see design in something, and we're going all the way from the telescope, now we're down to the microscope. It's everywhere. It's the fulfillment of Romans chapter 1. There's no excuse for anybody to stand before God now and sit there and say, I just didn't have enough evidence for your existence. That's why he says that you're without excuse because my eternal qualities, my eternal nature have been clearly seen by what I have made. And we really have no excuse in our generation because we have the science to build machines called micron uh, uh, telescopes or microscopes and so we could really get into this. 
and see that even it, the exact opposite of evolution has taken place. The smaller it is, the more complex it is. The exact opposite. I've got to show you this. And we've got to wait for this one. All right. Based on what you just saw tonight, okay, based on what you just saw, I think it's not only a sign, if you're to take a look at all this evidence and say it happened by chance, that maybe your chimney's clogged or something like that, okay, but I would say it's probably about as goofy, it's probably about as goofy as saying what I'm about to show you happened by chance. Let's take a look at what this guy created. Let's take a look. Finally tonight, we're going to show you something you won't believe, and we're not sure we believe it. But our Nick Watt saw it, photographed it, and we're going to show it to you. Now, for purposes of comparison, take a look at this. This is a ball of thread and a sewing needle. And the eye of that needle is so small that most of us have a dickens of a time trying to get a thread through it. But now, imagine an artist who can create an entire work of art inside the eye of that needle. Here's Nick. Perched on that pinhead is a $300,000 sculpture. Under the microscope, an elephant carved from a fragment of a grain of sand. I had to really scrape and just take my hand away and scrape. The tail is a dust fiber plucked from the air. Wigan sculptures are all smaller than the head of a pin or the eye of a needle. Do you enjoy this? I enjoy it when I finish it. Not working on it, no. It's, it's misery. It's painstaking. He uses tiny homemade tools and paints with a hair plucked from a house fly's back. That is a bit where the psychiatrist probably needs to see you afterwards. <laughs> he gets satisfaction from other people's amazement. Is it static? There it is. There it is. There's a static moving it. I'm not doing that. There's a static again. Disaster can strike at any time. It struck Alice in Wonderland. I was carrying it towards a needle. And then I looked through, again through the microscope and she'd gone, disappeared. I think I inhaled her. And if it all goes wrong, calmly, Wigan starts again. You know, I think I'm the most patient man on earth. This obsession began when Wigan was a lonely five-year-old. I, I have learning difficulties. Um, you know, I can't read or write. But I had to find a way of expressing myself. He started making houses for ants. Recently, he made this doll's house. That doll is the size of a human blood cell. The teachers at school made me feel small. So they made me feel like nothing. I'm trying to prove to the world that nothing doesn't exist. That less can be more. People haven't seen the best of me yet. I'm going to take it smaller. Even smaller than Charlie Chaplin balanced on an eyelash. Nick Watt, ABC News, Birmingham, England. I told you you wouldn't believe it. Now, I got another scenario based on that that I don't think you would believe either. Okay. What if watching that news broadcast, Charles, whatever his name is, right, gets back up there and he says, hold it, folks. I just want to expose to you right now that we've just been completely scammed because that uh, nano sculptures that you just saw, that is a complete product of chance. It happened over millions and millions of years the wind and the rain, he just found it in the dirt, and he's taking credit for it, okay? If somebody were to say that the nano sculptures of Willard Wiggins happened by chance, what would you say of that person? Yeah. Now, here's the whole point. Then why do we entertain the idea in our school, in our media, and we pay with it for our tax dollars saying that God's nano sculptures with the bacteria, the DNA, and the cells did? And it's more complex than that. That's the point. That's why, again, I think Robert Jastrow, the NASA PH scientist, says, hey, listen, that's why these guys are coming to a bad dream. When you start to look at this evidence, it's crazy to think it happened by chance. But again, that's right. Next time, we're going to take a look at the evidence of symbiotic relationships. And this is kind of cool, folks, because it really, uh, again, proves that things have to be there all at the same time in order for them to exist. We just read one, whether you realize it or not, in the Genesis account. On day three, God created the... Plants. And as we saw, plants need to be pollinated. Well, wait a second. Uh, God didn't create the bugs until later, until day six. So you got a three-day gap in there. Not a problem if those are literal 24-hour periods, okay? But if you don't want to take that literal and you want to say those are millions of years in between, how are the plants going to pollinate over millions of years? They're going to die. 
They have to be there. They're symbiotic. And there's a ton of symbiotic relationships all over the planet that these creatures have to be there fully working together or neither one of them can survive. That can't evolve. Lord willing, we'll get to that next time. Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief. Okay, the Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pull the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing 
and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a of death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. To trust in his work on the cross. To pardon us from all of our crimes. Our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh, uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.